Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the privilege that you've given us to just come together and feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, and we are in chapter 13. And I continue to be astounded by the fact that modern Christianity ignores 90% of the truth presented in the first epistle given to the church in the New Testament. Since we began this study, we have seen in simple, straightforward language the truth concerning our position in Christ, our relationship to Jesus Christ, and how God desires that we walk in relationship to that truth. Eleven chapters of marvelous doctrine of grace that leads to godliness. Not grace that leads to licentiousness, as, as so many go to great efforts to try to persuade you to believe, but just exactly the opposite. You know, like the hymn, Amazing Grace, except they don't really believe the words they're singing. It is the grace of God that prompts us to live a life holy and acceptable unto God. And so there is little wonder that our presenting our bodies as living sacrifices is said to be our reasonable service, our logical, reasonable service or worship. And I pointed out how that, that is, that's not our giving up something, but it has to do with our looking at what God has done for us in Christ, where that we then, on that basis, present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, because that's where we, we now live. That's where we now stand. That's where we walk. Being justified freely by His grace, where that the Holy Spirit has touched on every conceivable thought that man might possibly have when it comes to contrasting law and grace. His sovereign will with, with the will of the creature, divine election as opposed to man's uh, non-existent so-called freedom of choice. Folks, look, listen to me. I, I, I have a choice right now. I can, I can make videos. I can not make videos. I can make a ham sandwich. I can make a bologna sandwich. I can eat a hot dog. I can, I can cook a hamburger. I can eat beans. I can eat black-eyed peas. I have that choice. There's, that's what confuses Christians. Is they, they feel like that just because they can choose between mayonnaise or mustard, that they must be able to, to you know, they must have that freedom of choice when it comes to their uh, relationship with God. What they simply, simply fail to understand is that they're spiritually dead and they need to be brought to life first before they can believe, which is what the text teaches. They don't want to believe that. They don't want to believe that they are that spiritually in, in, impotent, incompetent. They don't want to believe that. It offends their sense of self-pride. We've had 11 chapters that tells us differently. And so I pointed out how that, that is, that's not our giving up something. It has to do with our looking at what God has done for us in Christ, where that we then on that basis present our bodies unto God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, because that's where we are now at. That's where we exist. That's where life is. That's where we are in our relationship to God. His sovereign will. He's supremely sovereign. That contrasted with the will of the creature, divine election as opposed to man's so-called freedom of choice. I chose you, you did not choose me, says the text. Our being spiritually dead, and, and in that condition of being spiritually dead, when we were enemies of God, not working for him, 
not loving him. In fact, we were God's enemies. He died in our place. In that condition of being spiritually dead, he brought us to life. In that condition, being given life from above by both the will and the timing of God, both, I've pointed that out. Scripture is very clear. I, I've, I've shown you folks two verses, one that's from Peter that says that it's his timing, one from John that says it's by his will. It's just, it's up to you what you do with those, with those verses. Not only is there nothing in the Bible about you choosing God, it is in all truth exactly the opposite. God chose you, and it is man that finds that truth repugnant in the face of his own false estimation of self, sense of self-worth and self-righteousness. We were raised from the dead spiritually, just as Jesus Christ raised Lazarus physically from the dead, just as the Father raised Christ from the dead. We are his and only his because Jesus Christ died in our place, because Jesus Christ planted us as wheat, not tear. Every jot and tittle presents in clear, unmistakable terms the fact that it is the life of Jesus contrasted with the sinful nature of the flesh and law, or that the light of God's truth dispels the darkness in our lives, or that freedom in Christ breaks the horrific chains of bondage that has enslaved you all of your life. Man doesn't want to perceive God as sovereign, but yet God's sovereign will is paramount in Scripture. From Genesis to Revelation, God is sovereign. But that, that sovereignty of God is most often despised in every aspect of human society, including modern Christianity. And we have even here been told that we are to be subject to the authorities which God himself has ordained for our good. We didn't put them there. We didn't vote them there. God did it. that the love of God fulfills the law completely, and now we are being told to put on Christ. And folks, I'm not sure I know how to put that into words. There is no possible way I could do that expression justice, but I am absolutely persuaded that our putting on Christ I'm absolutely convinced that our putting on Christ is not living the best we can according to the law. I'm ab absolutely 100% persuaded that our putting on Christ is our putting off sin, self, the law, and the flesh, and our putting on the sinless new man created in righteousness, holiness, and truth, that which only exists as a result of what Christ did. As a result of the finished work of Christ, which we can only come to know through the Word, and we all know that Jesus Christ is the Word, grace gives us tremendous freedom because we don't have to pretend anymore, folks, because we know that God loves us in spite of our faults and our failures. We don't have to, to worry what people think of us. We don't have to impress anyone including God. We can be honest with ourselves, with one another and with God. We can stop expending so much energy trying to create an image and trying to look good in other people's eyes, and we can just be our messy, imperfect human selves. Grace frees us, folks, to extend grace to others. We don't, we don't have to keep score. Who did what to us? It, it frees us from worrying about what we deserve and what our rights are and what other people owe us and how they ought to treat us. It frees us to just love people without worrying about whether we're getting what we deserve. It frees us to serve and love and give freely without calculating what we're owed in return. Grace gives us the freedom to simply love and be loved. 
God is love. And God's love is the product of God's grace. No wonder Romans 13, 8 says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Love is the result of God's grace, not the other way around. Love is the product of God's amazing grace in our lives. And now we find ourselves at the closing paragraph of this chapter. Verse 11, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. We perfectly know, is the word awaita, there's two words in the Greek for, for knowledge, at least two, uh, oida being perfect knowledge, gnosko being experiential knowledge. The word there is oida. We have, we perfectly know the season in which we are living. And we know that, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. The word to waken, to awaken, is agero, same word used of Jesus commanding others to rise up and walk or to rise up and follow him. And it is the same word used of Jesus himself rising up from the dead. And it's been said of us that we've been risen with Christ to walk in newness of life, his life. It's, it's our making, making true in our experience what is already true of us in Christ. Resurrection life. And the word is juxtaposed with the word sleep. And I'm fairly certain that that's not referring to physical sleep. Otherwise, the verse wouldn't make any sense. High time is, is the word already. The word already in the Greek is high time, implying completion. Completion. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. And I believe the word salvation to be re referring, if you look at the context, referring to our final and complete deliverance. A direct statement regarding our brief journey on this earth we know our lives are but a vapor it's nothing compared to eternity and folks we have one shot at this and when it's over it's over there are no do-overs and the only thing that we take with us when we leave this place the only thing is what christ has done in and through our lives that's it. All else goes up in smoke. There are no do-overs. And the only thing that will not pass away is God's word. We know that. The night is nearly over and the day is drawn near, says the original text. The word, the day, there in the text, clearly reveals that God compares the span of our lifetimes as a, as a period from sun to rise to sunset that's what the word means it, the, the word day I'm, I'm just trying to tell you the word day means just what it means day just what it says day a 24-hour period sunrise to sunset and it appears to me that god is comparing the span of our lifetimes as a period from sunrise to sunset that's a very short time not only that, but every time you see the sun rise and set, you can think of that as a reminder of your short time here on earth. So every 24-hour period we go through is, to me, a reminder of the totality of our present lives here on earth. The day is at hand. God has made it near. 
Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And I hope and pray that you folks realize what that text is saying. It's saying that we put off the old man and we put on Christ, the perfect finished work of Christ. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in clambering or chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. And we've come to understand through this study that sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Romans 6.14 And I want you to remember that Romans 6.11 was the very first command given us in the New Testament epistles. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that, that is not saying you got to strive to be dead to sin. But you've got to work real hard at it. And if you do so, then you might become dead to sin. It's not what the text is saying. It's saying that you are dead to sin. To count it as a fact, count it as true, that you are dead to sin, you died to sin, but you're alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. How is it that we've died? What does that really mean, that we've died to sin? Because we see sin every day in our lives. What it means is it means that we are not our old man. Okay? That is not us. It's not I that sins, but sin which dwells in me, said Paul. That's not you, folks. That is not you. That's not who you are. Yes, you sin, but that is not you who sins, but sin which dwells in you. You've been made a new creation in Christ Jesus. You've been given a sinless new nature that cannot sin because it has been born of God. That's where Jesus Christ abides. That's where he dwells. That's where he resides in you, in, in the new nature, the sinless new nature. Why? Because he could not be touched by sin. So we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. Dearly beloved, the ability that God grants us to rest in the provisions that he's given us. His gift of righteousness in us. His timing for all the events of our lives. His level of growth at any given time. And his pace for the accomplishment of our sanctification allows us full contentment and peace concerning the progress of our lives in him during any given phase of growth. Peace and joy in the Holy Spirit permits us to fasten our eyes upon him, not ourselves, not our own impatient discontentment over our seemingly slow progress. And it's not just about ourselves. It's about serving others and serving others proceeds out of the newness of his life in us, resulting from the overflow of his life within. Obvious as it might seem, the expression of this overflow can only be accomplished by our utter dependence upon him. So we come to know Christ through the word, for he is the word, and truth, which he fills with his life, and from which he ministers that life to others, because apart from him, we can do nothing. And I want you to meditate strongly, heavily on the fact, folks, that Christ Jesus himself, who was God of very God, who could not sin, did nothing apart from God the Father. Let that sink in. During his earthly ministry, he did only the will of the Father as the Father was manifest through his life, and it is no different when it comes to us. It's amazing how Christians today can think that they, as sinful creatures, can do what the Son of God, who was sinless, chose not to do.
He did only the will of the Father as the Father was manifest through his life. And it's no different when it comes to us. Trusting him that his truth is effective, that his sovereignty covers all circumstances, that his goodness assures our best is foremost with him, that his plan is perfect and right on schedule. This is the consistent theme throughout all, all of Scripture. It is the consistent theme that we've seen throughout this epistle, that we trust him in all things, and that almost concludes the 13th chapter, I suppose. We could move on to the 14th, where, where we will continue on and see how that we are to accept those weaker in the faith without judgment, the importance of unity, being of like mind with one another, avoiding controversy. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I pray that you are continue, continually being blessed by these, these chapters and these verses in Romans. It is only the truth that the truth is not this ministry. It's not this channel. The truth is this book. I've emphasized that time and time again. Don't believe something just because I, I believe it. Don't take my word for anything. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.